Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to thank and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Hi everyone and welcome to On The House, the Household Management Science Insights podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I'm your host, Gabriella Yastra, coming to you from NAM, Melbourne, Australia. Let's begin. Hi everyone and welcome back to the show. Today we're going to be talking from plate to planet, environmental impact of food waste with Dr. Tamara Soma, who is an assistant professor at Simon Fraser University and she's also the research director and co-founder of the Food Systems Lab. Hi, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining me. Do you mind introducing yourself in a bit more detail so we can learn more about who you are? Absolutely. So my name is Tamara Soma, and I am an assistant professor at Simon Fraser University with the School of Resource and Environmental Management. And I'm actually calling in from the unceded ancestral and traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil First Nation uh, up here in Burnaby uh, Mountain. I'm originally from Indonesia, and I am the research director of the Food Systems Lab, where we conduct research from the farm to the table um, to the dump and beyond, including outer space. Wow, outer space. That's really the whole world and beyond. Absolutely. (laughs) I'd love to learn more about that. Um, But before we do, um, we're going to do a section called Have You Met Tamara Soma, uh, where we get to know you through some of your favorite things. Uh, First thing we'd like to know is what is your favorite book? Wow. Okay. So in terms of my favorite book, I'm actually not going to go academic. I'm just going to go with the book that I read every single day. Um, and that is the Holy Quran for me. Um, and the Holy Quran helps me. Um, it's it's a really great reminder as a food system scholar of the importance of uh, making sure that food is shared with everyone, that we care about the human right um, to food, um, and that I always look at food with gratitude. Oh, that's amazing. Um Yeah, I think that we can forget that, you know, it is so important, I think, that we share our food and we share our knowledge and we share and we're we're thankful for it as well. So thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. I think one thing that I just want to mention is um, in our current context, especially when people are so busy, um, it can be easy to look at food as just like a commodity or just calories that you have to scarf in and eat really fast. And I think for me and actually many indigenous peoples in Canada, Food is um, kind of like a spiritual medicine. And so that's kind of like how I like to think about it. It's really something that's nourishing for the soul. Mm. And something, I mean, I've noticed a bit more um, growing up is, you know, we have so many different cultures with it, but they're all, all of their festivities seem to be centered around food and family and sharing food and family. And I think, um, I don't know much about, you know, nourishing the soul with food, but I do know that um, food is really important for our cultural connections. Yeah, absolutely. It it's it's a way for us to celebrate our identities as well. Mm-hmm. So, um, being an and being an Indonesian, like living in Canada, it's always so important for me to be able to actually have some access to some of the food that I love from back home, and then also to be able to cook it at home for my children. So, um, food and belonging and identity is definitely all interconnected. Mm-hmm. I, I have I've definitely felt that. Um... When I'm in a different country, I'll either really crave rice or really crave bread, depending on <laughs> which country I'm in, because I grew up with both of them being really important parts of my yes. culture and my diet. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, definitely. Um, actually, I have this saying from my dad. You know, if um, if you don't, if you, if as Indonesians, if you have not eaten rice, then you have not eaten at all, um, and that's really funny. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm not quite that far. I think um, I grew up eating a lot of rice, but not not every day. Not um, every day. But yeah, I know that for some people, yeah, you eat rice every day, Everything. every meal. Yeah. No, no meal is complete <laughs> without rice. Absolutely. <laughs> mm. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and have you enjoyed any movies recently? Oh dear, I've been so busy. So um, besides the movies that I watch with my little ones, you know, which is I'm not really watching it. I'm just spending time with them. And the one movie that I remember loving so much and that I watch over and over again is Interstellar. 
Um, uh -huh. It's just such an exciting and fascinating movie. I don't know if you've watched it with Matthew McConaughey. I think I did. I think, was it the time travel one? Yes, the time travel one. <laughs> I love it so much. And actually that's part of my, um, that actually is connected to my research um, around food and outer space. It's about this kind of, this idea of this world where we've really destroyed everything, sadly. Um, and Earth is no longer inhabitable. So having to go and find another planet to kind of like start over is really interesting. Um, and so, you know, there's been a lot of conversation around food and Mars and also uh, space food technologies and how that might have implications for Earth. And so I've recently with my colleagues published several papers on food and outer space uh, and what that might look like and what are some of the critiques around that. So um, any, I'm a, I'm a big space um, movie buff. I mean, not buff, addict. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I mean, I haven't considered, you know, I, I think I grew up, you know, seeing, you know, I think, you know, there was a bit of a space craze when I was a kid and seeing the kind of food that they would take up, you know, like ice cream and stuff and getting to try the ice cream. It really wasn't very good. Uh, but I haven't really thought much about, I guess, what we're going to be eating sustainably um, in space if we, if we do fortunately, unfortunately, get up there. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I don't know. I, I really hope that if we do go up there, it's not because we've destroyed the planet. Certainly. Exactly. I think, I think maybe let's invest more time on the planet. And then, um, yeah, I, I what, because the, the amount of um, effort, investment and technology that's going to look into um, like inhabiting Mars and creating human settlements there, I think there's lots of great ways that we can use it here on Earth to solve our current problems. Yeah, I think it's a lot easier to fix the planet we're on rather than making another Earth. planet <laughs> start again. With toxic soil and um, no oxygen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you, do you listen to any podcasts? Oh my gosh, I, I there's just there's just so many. But um, I I'm I'm on a podcast right now telling you that I don't listen to very many podcasts. Uh, but um, however, I will say that there's a really great uh, podcast here in Canada that is run by graduate students working on food systems issue. And my several of my students have been on that podcast. It's called the Hand Picked Podcast, um, run out of uh, Wilfrid Laurier University. And so definitely people should check it out. It's called Handpicked Podcast. And it's all about uh, food research and um, especially highlighting students' work. Oh, amazing. Um, I love how many niche but interesting podcasts there are out in the world. So I'll have to check that out. Yes, I know. Exactly. And that's the one thing sometimes like there's just so many out there. It's over, It's overwhelming. But, you know, sometimes you have like these gems. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and do you have a role model? My mother, <laughs> my mother, well, actually my parents, but my mother, especially um, my mother is just that one person who, um, so my memory of my mother, I remember um, when I was little is, uh, so she's a doctor, she's a medical doctor, she's in Indonesia. And I remember being in the middle of a street and someone was injured. I, I was so tiny back then. I was maybe a toddler. And then like seeing all of the chaos and the carnage and my mother like running and saying, I'm a doctor, I can help. And it's just like, it's that one moment where you're like, my mom is a superhero, um, right? And so she's a, she's a superhero professionally, but she's also a superhero um, at home and she makes the best egg rolls. So <laughs> that also works. A very commendable person can save people's lives and make the best egg rolls. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and um, have you completed any courses that have inspired you? Oh yes, absolutely. So I mean, I'm I'm a professor, but I'm always learning. So I recently just completed a permaculture certificate um, and have had the most amazing teacher. So actually, one of my permaculture instru instructor, he lives in New Zealand. His name is James Richardson. Um, and then I have another permaculture instructor. Her name is Kim uh, Kimchi, actually, which is like a lovely food name. Um, and they have been teaching me about everything about permaculture, about uh, mushrooms, about growing food, about soil. And I just absolutely, I fell in love with permaculture because of them. And um, yeah, I think everyone should check it out. Can you explain what permaculture is? Oh, it's it's big. It's, it's a whole system and relationship um, of understanding um, the, the planet and kind of like trying to um, grow food, uh, live your life, relate 
um, to others in a way that is very gentle um, and also regenerative. Um, so basically, permaculture is the exact opposite of what we have right now in a dominant uh, food system, which is very extractive, very wasteful, very industrial, and also very commoditized, very commodified. Um, so permaculture is um, very gentle, regenerative, and it's not just about growing food, but it's also about a lifestyle of, you know, natural natural building, like cob houses, um, and um, making your own preserved foods like canning, and, um, you know, making like kombucha, like all of those kind of things that like, it's like about um, increasing your capacity to also be self-sufficient. Uh, so I, I love it, but it's, it's, more than just like organic agriculture or you know something like that it's it's bigger interesting so it's um it's a it's a it's, it's one title but for so many different systems and different things yes yes and it also includes relationship between people so a non-extractive relationship between people is also part of a permaculture uh, mindset yes of course i think that we forget that you know human labor does go into farming into producing food and some of it is exploitative it is, it is. And, mm. and this is absolutely the case in Canada, especially because um, the Canadian agriculture system is so reliant on migrant farm workers and many of them do not have the same, most of them do not have the, the same rights that um, Canadian labor um, would have. And it's um, it can be very, very harrowing, their experience. I think we had something similar come to light in Australia a couple of years ago. Um, with we've got a lot of um, people who come like black backpackers who come and um, pick fruits and because they don't have as many protections they can also be exploited a lot yes absolutely and so permaculture counters all of that and uh, it's something that I it, it really aligns with my value great thank you maybe we'll have to do another episode on permaculture <laughs> absolutely there's tons of permaculture experts in Australia tons great. and tons great um, so we're going to move on to our topic today, which is the environmental impact of food waste. Um, but before we do start on that, um, I like to get a few definitions so that we're all starting on the same level. So first thing I'd like to know is what is, how do you define household management? So actually that question is interesting because I spent a lot of time unpacking and critiquing the idea of household management, the way it, it in terms of the ways in which it's been defined and framed in more of a Western context. Mm -hmm. So let me just kind of like, um, I don't have a definition that would that would fit. Um, and the reason being is because in an Indonesian context of, especially where, where I did my research for my PhD, the idea of a household is so fluid. You know, we're talking about sometimes 13 people in a household. We're talking about sometimes multiple staff members, whether it be domestic helpers, chauffeurs, you know, in terms of a, a higher income household, even kin and relatives would be in and out of a household. So when I was doing my, um, when I was doing a lot of household uh, food waste research in the Western context, a lot of the idea about what a household is, is based on a nuclear family type of household, which was completely shattered in the Indonesian case, you know, 13 people, 20 people, you know, um, people coming in and out, in-laws, uh, multiple grandchildren, suddenly it was very hard to kind of like contain and compartmentalize what is a household, especially when all of them are doing different things, shopping different places, bringing different food. Um, so it just, you know, it, it, it kind of like blew my mind in terms of like, so when you're actually trying to come up with policies to address household food waste, who is the pinpoint here? How do we actually, you know, tailor our suggestion towards that kind of household? Yeah, I've never thought about that before because I think on the on our show we certainly talk about, you know, families, but usually families are maybe one to two adults and then children, and that's it's a lot easier to I think make a decision about what you're going to eat, how you're going to run the house when you've got two adults and children who just sort of do what you tell them to do. Whereas if you're dealing with, you know, grandparents, aunts, uncles, um, staff, it's a lot more complex. I never thought about that before. Exactly. So, for example, I've been in households where the domestic helpers would be in charge of shopping, um, but then the person who is the employer would be in charge for, of cooking 
And then another person might be in charge of like, you know, dealing with the waste. Um, and it's very, and then sometimes they would make food with the older teenage kids coming in and saying like, well, I've already gone, taken my, got my takeout, you know, <laughs> from, from uh, like, you know, one of the fast food restaurants. And then suddenly, you know, all of the plans, like everything that was planned for the food for the family just kind of shatters with all of those different kind of decisions happen happening spontaneously, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Um, and that does sort of, I think, lead into my next question, which is what is zero waste cooking? So I think I think with zero waste cooking, um, it's becoming a harder, harder thing to do, to do zero waste cooking. Um, one thing that I know in a lot of the low income households that I work with, um, especially in Indonesia, is that because they um, usually work and get um, uh, some daily remun remuneration, for example, maybe they're in the construction, um, you know, industry. And so they just get their daily um, honorarium and they would spend it on food for that um, for that day only. So the term used is buy today, um, eat today. And so they would buy in a small amount, cook it and then eat it and then it would be finished, you know, in the mm -hmm. same day. Um, so that is an example of zero waste cooking just because of the amount you buy. You can't you can't hoard it. You can't stock up. You're really just buying at the moment for that day's con consumption. Um, another aspect of zero waste cooking is the fact that in um, many any in in places where animals are more integrated into kind of like households or even urban living, um, usually some of those scraps can be fed to animals like the chickens or even the catfish. Like there was like one family that I went to that had catfish and they would, you know, give out the food scraps to the catfish and then they would eat the catfish. So I would love to think about zero waste cooking as a circular mm -hmm. food system, really. Um, so that's kind of like what I think about it. Interesting. That's very different, I think, from other people who have come onto the show before. But I think it's really great because we're getting different perspectives of different ways of, you know, living life, which is, I think, what we're trying to do on this podcast. So it's it's less about maybe making sure we don't have food waste, but about finding interesting, uh, you know, uh, other ways of using the food waste, for example, giving it to your pets who you can then, or chickens, who you can then eat. And then sort of like the circular, that's amazing. <laughs> Yeah. And I mean, the thing is also in terms of food, there will be, there's definitely going to be parts of the food that we will eat and is edible. And then there's just going to be some that it's just not possible for us to eat at all. And that's where animals really play an important part because they're not as picky. <laughs> <laughs> and you also mentioned that it's getting harder to do this nowadays. Is that because, you know, I, I certainly don't have any chickens or catfish who are available to eat my scraps. Is that why, or are there any other reasons? Well, that is a big um, that is a big reason. Actually, is um, I'm an I'm an urban planner. I'm a food system planner. So a food system planner is a planner that integrates food system consideration into land use planning and and planning policies and decision making. And one thing that we've done is we've created cities that are completely disconnected to the food system. And so, for example, you have situations where even recently in Burnaby, the city that I'm in. Uh, for the longest time, so from Vancouver, um, maybe most of your uh, followers will know the city of Vancouver. So Vancouver, um, they have a bylaw that allows for backyard chickens, whereas Burnaby didn't for the for the longest time. And I think only recently they've allowed it. But then at the same time, most people don't actually have the space to be able to keep chickens. So even if it's permitted, it's not possible, right? So there's all of these kind of things where we we didn't food food is food the our kind of interaction to food is more about making sure that people get access to the supermarket but not really about kind of like connecting all of that system of production to consumption to you know um that that circular piece that i was talking to you about mm -hmm. okay so that's it. so yeah we've made it more difficult for us to i guess participate in that circular um circular system of, of food but is there a way that we can you know try to amend this are you, should we should we all get chickens if we have the space for it i think we need to maybe maybe because it's difficult i mean i live in a building um in a in a you know a, what is a typically like an apartment building and it's very difficult to do that however 
I do have a community garden plot where I would walk and um, I have a few vegetables there. I grow my garlic, my kale and my collard greens. And um, it might be possible to at least have some of the community spaces uh, be transformed into these types of food hubs where you can have that kind of a micro uh, scale of that circular food system. Because again, one of the things that I think about as a food system scholar is how much of what we're doing is so distant and disconnected from all of the 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 kind of uh, the the resource extraction from the point of production is very much disconnected from the nutrients that will come at the end stream, right? So instead, if you actually had that kind of place-based system, that permaculture system, or um, you know, where you actually growing the food and then the the food scraps is then turned into compost and that compost goes back to your garden, that that kind of system is so beautifully connected. And we we don't have a lot of that because I might have um, a mango from Indonesia come to Canada and then maybe I eat half and then the rest gets thrown out, that, that gets thrown out into like a composting system that will then be shipped to like another province, you know, like it's, it's a very complex web that we have now. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing that something like, you know, providing more spaces for this, this isn't something that, I mean, it is possibly something that we can do ourselves. You know, if we have space like a garden, you know, we can maybe set up composting, we could have chickens, we could grow our own vegetables, but you know, if you don't have the facilities around, um, I'm guessing then it would be maybe councils you know, asking councils to put in these um, systems. Yeah. And what I want to say is that especially in countries like Canada, Australia, um, you know, and others uh, where we have investment in things like public education or public libraries or public community centers, it makes a lot of sense to also invest in public food systems, because um, that's another thing that I feel like we've kind of pushed aside for the markets to solve when actually food is a human right and simply putting it on the supermarkets or the market to solve is not, um, I would say it's not the best idea because in a way you're kind of putting all of your eggs in one basket whereby access to market requires that you have access to income mm -hmm. and not all of us have the same amount of income. And this is where like a community food center or like a public food infrastructure would make a huge difference in really supporting many of the communities that would otherwise require access to food banks just to make ends meet. This reminds me, um, I, I am quite lucky. I live in Australia. Um, I always have access to food, but um, there's a neighborhood house near me that um, they grow their own veggies and they actually have a little sign that says, pick veggies if you want. Um, and so you can just take you know vegetables, herbs from the garden if you need it. And we had a homeless person who was living in the park next to it and I actually saw him go over there and take some things to eat. And I thought it was really lovely to see this garden in action because I actually haven't seen many people taking food from the garden. I think everyone's a little scared. Yeah. And um, so I would say that for your listeners, it would be good to check out this book and it's open access book. It's called The Routledge Handbook of Food as Commons. And so Food as Commons is... Um, a, a conceptual a conceptualization of this idea that I mentioned, whereby instead of just kind of privatizing everything, is that we share, right? So if we have uh, if we create a community orchard, for example, of apples, then that will be our common, and us will be we will all be stewards, and we will all take care of the orchards. And so, therefore, it's about sharing rather than saying like, well, I'm going to privatize and put gates and fences across this. And no one else but me will have access. And even if I have too many apples, well, that's too bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, so um, it's a different approach and it's, it's a free open access book. So I highly recommend it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, how, I mean, it, it seems to make sense, but um, I want to ask how can cooking sustainably help, you know, individuals, but also groups of people? Um, I'm guessing, you know, as we were talking about sharing food means that you know, everyone's got some food, but, you know, what are some other ways that, you know, it, um, cooking sustainably can help people? Well, there's um, direct um, relationship to how cooking sustainably can help people, but there's also the indirect, which is the environmental 
um, impact. And so you might not see that immediately, but it it, it does ha- have a cascading you know impact. And so in terms of cooking sustainably, um, I actually like um, the, the so there there were, there were like several articles um, about cooking um, with Mexican ingredients and how in Mexico, because there are some key staples, it's very easy to transform leftovers into something else that that is part of a uh, of another dish. And um, in a way, so it's it's just about having some of the key staples. So therefore, you don't have to spend too much money. And whatever leftovers can be transformed um, into something that's also delicious with some of the other basic key staples. Like it's almost like, so if you make um, beans and rice and then you still have some leftover beans and rice, well, you can make that into a burrito just with some wraps and like some, you know, tomatoes. Um, it's it's the idea of, uh, of really kind of like cooking sustainably is also about cooking economically sometimes. Um, although it's not always, people don't always think about um, sustainability as being less expensive, right? Usually, like if you think about cooking sustainably, or oh, are you talking about making things with organic food or or like, you know, something that is more expensive, but actually it can also, it, it can be a win-win situation. Um, and then some some scholars like my colleague, Dr. Christian Reynolds, um, he does a lot of work on cooking sustainably, sustainably with um, the type of material. So gas oven versus electric oven, microwave versus boiling versus steaming versus. So he actually measures everything um, and it's very interesting. And I think people should check out his work because he would kind of explain how if you're actually cooking with an oven and you're actually cooking something very small, it's very energy intensive. So therefore, it's not sustainable. It would be better to cook that in a microwave. That's an example. Interesting. Yeah. Um in my parents' old house, we had a really lovely um, ov- uh, oven and stove, but it was huge. It was like um, twice the size of a normal oven. And, you know, sometimes I just want to make a grilled cheese. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, there's there are the toaster ovens. There's like the, the, the new uh, inventions like the air fry and the Instapot and all of these things. My kitchen is small. I can't really have all of those gadgets. And so I, I just do some basic stuff. Um, but what I do know in terms of cooking sustainably is just always trying to use ingredients that um, I know that I will use multiple times. Because mm-hmm. often if you're getting only the one-off ingredient, it'll go, you know, you might make that one recipe using one cup of that, you know, sauerkraut or whatever, and then realizing that you'll never use it ever again <laughs> until the next season or um, so, yeah, I do that. That That's very relatable because I do that so often with herbs. Um, I think I just didn't grow up eating herbs very much, so I don't know how to use them. And so, oh, I'll buy some coriander for, I don't know, these tacos. And then I won't eat that. Then it'll just wilt in the freeze fridge. And I'm like, I don't know what to do with it. With it. Um, whereas, you know, things that I'm more comfortable with using, um, for example, chicken, um, and then I'll reuse the chicken for a salad, for a sandwich after I've made chicken. And um, so do you have any tips on how to, I guess, get better at, you know, you said before, sticking with things that you know, um, but it seems a bit boring, you know, I still want to learn how to cook different things. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, there's lots of websites that can help you with strategy. So like you mentioned about the coriander. So when I was um, when I was doing my PhD, my friend who is from Nepal, her name is Sujata, she used to take coriander. And so I used to only eat it as kind of like garnishes, right? You would put it in like spring, like rice, um, like, um, sorry, like those um, fresh uh, spring rolls and and like noodles and whatever. And what she did with the coriander was that she would use the coriander she would puree it in a blender with some um, lemon juice, olive oil, and also like um, the Thai chili um, peppers and maybe a little bit of tomatoes. And then she would make these like really awesome green goddess kind of sauce. Uh Uh, And it tastes so amazing. And you can do that with wilted coriander because it doesn't matter. It's going to get pureed anyway. Um, so that's like one strategy that I learned from her. Um, and, and another thing also is like when in doubt, you can always freeze things. So if you have wilted coriander, you can um, puree it uh, with a little bit of water and then just put in ice cubes. And then uh, that will you can use it for the next round. 
Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, that's actually great because, I mean, I particularly like the green goddess sauce idea because um, I always want sauces with my foods, but I'm not very good at making them. And I have all of those ingredients. I have lemon, I have olive oil, I even have tomato. That's so easy. Exactly. It's really easy and it tastes very good. And just salt and pepper, coriander, and um, you can put as many chilies as you want to, to make it either spicier or not too spicy. And it is awesome. Like you put it in anything, it just makes it taste good. Um, you can also put garlic, a little bit of garlic. Mm -hmm. All things I have in my cupboard, except the chilies. Exactly. So that's, that's fine. I yeah. don't need chili. Much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, any other tips, you know, that, you know, we can use to, um, you know, reuse our food a bit more? Yeah, actually, I was going to say, thank, thanks for reminding me. So in Canada, we have this website called lovefoodhatewaste.ca. And it, it was based on the um, on the UK campaign, Love Food Hate Waste, by the organization RAP. Um, and so in lovefoodhatewaste.ca, you can actually put in ingredients and it will tell you all of the different ways that you can use it. Um, uh. And so I find that that's something that might help people, especially if they're not really sure what to do. And it gives you the recipe. It gives it gives you what to do with, when you have leftovers. Um, gives lots of tips. So lovefoodhatewaste.ca is a pretty good website. Great. Thank you for that. Um, I always love a good website that'll help me to do things. So long as I remember to uh, look it up. Yes, to actually do it, to look it to up. To actually yeah. do it. Yep. Um, and, you know, have you found any sort of um, technology or innovations that can contribute to sustainable cooking and food preservation? So one thing that I've been interested in and quite fascinated by is um, around freeze drying. And so um, freeze drying currently is a very expensive process. So I don't know if you know what freeze drying food looks like. It's the one where it's kind of dried up, right? And then if you add liquid to it, then it, um, you know, it, it, it rehydrates itself, mm -hmm. but it, it does lengthen the shelf life significantly. So um, it's good for emergency food and it's also good for reducing food waste, especially when you think about all of the potential food that might be wasted at the farm. And if you can like freeze dry it, that's a really great way to preserve the harvest, but it's very, very expensive. So one thing that I'm kind of looking into is just um, potential companies and startups that might be um finding ways to make freeze drying uh, a cheaper, more accessible way so that it's not just something that corporations can do, but maybe like just household people can do, because that would be really cool. That'd be really cool. I love um, I love all the different gadgets that we can use to, you know, dry things out, preserve things. Um, and freeze drying sounds fun. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but it is expensive right now. So <laughs> Okay, not quite yet. Not quite not yet. Not quite yet. <laughs> um, and, you know, can you explain what nose to tail or root to stem cooking is? Yeah. Um, so I, my student and I actually wrote a paper about this. Um, she is um, from Siksika First Nation, which is one of the indigenous nations here in Canada. And she talked about how her um, mother, sorry, her grandmother would actually, so they would hunt a bison and they would use every single part of the animal from the fur to the hoofs, um, you know, for kind of like buttons and everything um, to even the stomach lining. Um, the stomach lining is called parflesh and they would actually use it to line um, the, 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 the ground for the cooking and every single part of the animal would be, would be utilized. So the whole nose to tail is a kind of different way of treating animals, not just as kind of these body parts that you see in the supermarket, the chicken breast, the chicken thigh, the chicken wings, what happened to the head? It's missing. What happened to the legs? It's missing. Salmon. Okay. So there's part of the body there. What happened to the head? What happened to the tail? Right. Um, so I come from Indonesia where I'm used to kind of seeing the whole entire animal in traditional wet markets and where um, consumption of offals, like that's what it's called. I don't know if it's called offals in Australia. I think um, so, yeah. Yeah, so like organ meats um, is common, like eating the brain, eating the intestine. Um, it's so, so common. We even have lung chips. Like, you know, <laughs> I, I remember like as a child eating lung chips and you're like thinking about it now in the Canadian context. Like, I don't think I can go to a 
child in Canada and be like, hey, you want some lung chips? Um, <laughs> probably, probably not, but it tastes delicious. Um, and that's something that, uh, you know, I really don't know what happens to all of those animal body parts. Uh, I feel like um, we are so disconnected to the point where when we see, when we eat meat here, it's really something that is presented in a styrofoam with the wrapped in saran wrap. And they're just like, usually like the breast, the wings and the drumstick, the thighs maybe, but that's it. Mm. Yeah, I find that as well. So yeah, my family um, on my mom's side, they're Chinese. And so grew up eating chicken legs or tripe. I'm not a huge fan, to be honest, <laughs> but um I remember going and talking to my partner's family um, and be, they're like, oh, you eat the, the the fish eyes? You eat the whole... And I'm like, yeah, why wouldn't I? Like, it's just, why wouldn't I eat that? I mean, I don't really like it that much, but, you know, if it was presented to me, I'd probably eat it. I think that just blew their minds. Um, so, yeah, I think that, you know, often we can kind of forget that. Um, it can be very normal to eat just, you know, the prawn heads or the all of those delicious things that maybe it's a bit harder to eat you have to look them in the eye <laughs> um, you know but that's that's part of the thing though um one of the beautiful thing about the story that my student shared in this article that we wrote together um is that it's a different relationship with the animal it's based on respect it's based on thinking about the animal as a whole and not just as pieces of body parts that's commoditized and in a way, you do try to eat less but better quality. Um, and I think that looking at the animal in the eye and understanding that in eating meat, you are taking a life is something that is much better because in that sense, we can think about the animal's quality of life as well. Um, mm -hmm. This uh, summer, this last summer, I spent time with my... Um, kids at the farm um, working like my kids were learning about um, uh, they were at a farm camp like a summer farm camp and I was myself doing some research with the community um, partners um, at the farm and the way that the animals are treated there they're like they're like family and they are um, in their natural environment and they're happy and they are like so the goats are like jumping and playing um, you can't do that in a factory farm where they're constrained and they're completely out of their natural behavior and natural environment um, so I think about nose to tail as a possibility for a much more respectful relationship with animals and I think that um, you know a lot of people they kind of see where food comes from, you know, because they're so disassociated with a steak is a steak and it's just a piece of meat. And then you see the whole animal that it came from and they they suddenly go, oh, I don't want to eat meat at all. I can't fathom the idea of, you know, harming an animal. And then, you know, I think that's at least how I've seen on depictions of vegetarianism. But, you know, would, would maybe you say instead of eating animals altogether, we should just be vegetarian and um, stop eating meat? Um, I think being vegetarian may work for some people. Um, I'm I'm someone that um, is quite pragmatic in terms of uh, the importance of place-based food, and especially living in Canada and knowing many northern um, Indigenous remote communities that live from the land. Uh, if you're trying to be vegetarian in that kind of climate, in that kind of geography, it's just not possible. Um, and so I think. What's really important is understanding the system, especially that's, I, that's why I call like the place-based approach, is that we all come from a place, all of the plants, the animals that we eat come from a place and understanding how they fit within that place and how um, a particular, uh, say in, in, in BC, in British Columbia, the province where I'm living in, salmon is such an important uh, food, not just for consumption, but also as um, for ceremony for spirituality. And so I can imagine, for example, um, a community whose entire livelihood and spirituality and tradition and practices intergenerationally is so tied to salmon, um, kind of just saying like, uh, having someone tell them you're wrong, don't eat meat. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's not realistic nor practical, but 
but it will work for some people in some context. So um, definitely go for it if it works for you. <laughs> okay. And does, you know, does reducing or stopping meat consumption have any other benefits? Um, or, you know, it's it's just sort of place-based? Well, I think that um, some people need to eat much, much less and some people actually need to eat a bit more. Um, it all depends on your um, your health and your um, nutrition level and what you need in terms of, um, you know, the all of the vitamins and the minerals and the proteins. Um, another thing also is that uh, in the global north, in very rich countries, there needs to be a significant reduction because even from a portion size alone, even from the, the fact that uh, meat is consumed, for example, three times a day for breakfast, you have the bacon or something like that. For lunch, you have more meat and then dinner, you have more meat. Maybe for snack, you'll have some jerky, <laughs> you know, it's just like meat, meat, meat everywhere. Um, and the meat that is consumed, if it's coming from factory farms, then there's a lot of negative implications, not just for the environment, but also for the animal's well-being and life itself. And so certainly that's where you say, this needs to be curtailed because meat is something that um, probably should be consumed um, in moderation or in, in the context of Global North. Maybe it's something you eat like three times a week, not every single day. Uh, that's why they have this um, thing called Meatless Monday, mm -hmm. right? So it's just like one of those things where, hey, on a Monday, maybe just cut out the meat for a bit and eat some other things like lentils and beans and tofu and other things. Mm, delicious. I can't imagine having meat three times a day. It seems way too much. It probably, it probably, I mean, although if you're making a big batch of something, then you might eat the same food. <laughs> so, that's true. I mean, that's, that's probably what will get you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Was there anything else that you wanted to talk about, um, about sustainability in food? Well, um, the one thing I will say, I, I think you you also mentioned about root to stem. And one thing that was interesting, um, especially from a food waste lens, is how um, many of us have kind of like lost that kind of cooking ability to, to understand how to process or cook like some of the different parts of the vegetables. Uh, so, for example, it's very common to go to a supermarket in Canada and see the broccoli crowns without the stem. And so the stem would get wasted, but then the stem is also actually edible, right? Um, and it's the same thing with celery. So you would see all these celery and the celery would have their leaves completely chopped up. So it would just be like the celery stalk and it would be short. And you're thinking, but actually the leaf is amazing and it's great with soup, it's great with salad, it's great with lots of different things. So um, I think it's not just about the lack of capacity the lack of ability or understanding or training in terms of how to even deal with the whole nose to tail piece. It's even root to stem. Like for example, with carrots, the um, the leaf of the carrots can actually be used for pesto, mm -hmm. right? Um, and in kale, like um, my, my daughter actually loves this, but when I grow kale, sometimes when it gets a bit old, it would flower and she actually loves eating the flower of the kale delicious uh, yeah or the flower of the broccoli so it's just like those things where like oh it's actually edible it's fine <laughs> mm -hmm. or or then there's the other side i think um i think my partner bought some rhubarb and tried to cook it and he he added something he was not supposed to the leaves or something and then we were like no don't do that don't do that um and i think we had to throw the whole batch away because he added the leaves in yeah, yes, uh, certain things are poisonous. So you you need to know what you can put in as well. Absolutely, definitely. Mm. And I, I have not yet seen anyone to eat like a pineapple skin, which is pretty sharp or a durian skin. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've seen that. I, I, I do know someone who eats eggshell. How do you eat eggshell? So um, they would crush, they would... Um, Put the eggshells in in an oven or like dry it or something and then they would crush the eggshell in a food processor and then that calcium the eggshell powder can be mixed into pancake batter um so it's actually good for like your garden so it's good for like additional calcium for your soil if you want to do that but it's also good for like um, adding calcium to it, a pancake batter so um she does that 
Interesting. Okay, so you can uh, make a big batch of eggshells and then most can go in your garden. You put a little bit in your pancakes for you. Yep, extra calcium. <laughs> Delicious. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you have any other tips of how people can, you know, use the whole vegetable? Uh, there's just so many, but um, definitely at least if people start with the broccoli and don't waste the broccoli stock and just really like cut it nicely and thinly, I think that would be a really great start. Another thing that I actually don't do that I notice a lot of people do is a lot of people peel their vegetables and mm. I just don't have time to peel my vegetables, um, especially for most vegetables like, um, uh, like carrots and like uh, potatoes. So often what I would do with potatoes is I would just scrub them really well and just chop them and put them right in. Because really when you're peeling the potatoes, you're losing a lot of the flesh and um, the skin often has uh, vitamins too. So it's a, it's a bit of a shame. Yep. I got to say, I am very lazy and I don't peel my vegetables. And I always like, it's because of the, it's because of the vitamins. It's definitely because <laughs> of the vitamins and not because I hate peeling. Yeah, you, you, we can just justify it as much as mm -hmm. we want. Just yeah, <laughs> yeah. And people, some people peel cucumbers and I'm just like, what are you doing? Exactly. Um, in Indonesia, they peel cucumbers and um, I guess maybe it's for cleanliness. I'm not sure, but I, I just eat the whole cucumber. Um, my dad peels grapes. That's always mind boggling. That's just like, dad, why are you so odd? <laughs> I love my dad, but he... He would like sit down and peel every like, little like grape skin because he just doesn't prefer it. And um, and I'm always kind of just like looking at him with admiration and awe and confusion. But, you know, my dad is my dad. <laughs> Man, I can barely be bothered peeling a, a mandarin. <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine like one grape at a time? <laughs> no, thanks. No. I think I'd rather just not eat it. Yeah, Put it in yeah. a, maybe juice it or something. <laughs> Yeah, he's, he's funny. <laughs> he's funny, my dad. Um, so we'll move on to the practices and habits section. And I'd love to know what is the practice that you do to manage your cooking or your food waste in your home? So what I do um, in terms of cooking is I, so I have, I'm, I'm, we are a family of five. I have three children and they often eat a lot. Um, for me, I like to do things that are easy because of my schedule, because of my husband's schedule, because of the three kids. So I do a lot of slow cooking. And when I do slow cooking, um, usually it's in a, a bigger batch, right? For example, like I would make stew or I would make like chili. Um, the good thing about that is I would usually freeze the leftovers. And that's something that I can just like reheat and cook for next time. But especially for me, something that I do is if I'm making, like, say I'm making beef chili, mm -hmm. is that I would then use any of the leftover um, for like pasta and I would just kind of like stir fry pasta into it, right? Um, because then it, it's kind of like a spaghetti kind of thing. <laughs> um, so like any way that any way that I can kind of just like mix and weave things together is is always a good thing. And my kids love fried rice. They really, really love fried rice. So what I would do is I would make rice for something else, like, you know, rice and soup, but then there's usually always leftovers and then they get fries, fried rice in the, in the morning. Delicious. Um, yeah, my, my partner also loves fried rice. So we often make a bit of extra fried rice so that, um, just chuck in anything we've got in the fridge. Um, I put in, what was it? I put in some chicken, uh, Thai chicken curry in the fried rice the other day. It was nice. delicious. Yes. I love that. That's good. I'll try that sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. And I, I also really love your idea of, you know, you know, stretching out or reusing um, like your chili in um, with pasta, because, you know, I think after three days of eating the same thing, I'm a bit bored. But if you change it up a little bit, you know, it's still the same thing, but different enough that you still enjoy it. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing is with um, that's that's the whole thing about that kind of foundation, right? And I have a, a friend of mine, her name is Kelsey. And what she would say is that um, what you're doing is you're shopping from your fridge. So think about it. So it makes it more exciting when you're shopping from your fridge. Um, and so when you look at the leftovers or like that kind of leftover chili or whatever, um, it, you're, you're, it's, it doesn't seem boring when you're like, oh, I'm shopping, you know, oh, this is 
this one ingredient and you just have to add a few things to it to make it new. Like, cause you can make chili for like lasagna, right? Cause you can just layer the meat. Um, you can make it for taco. You can make it for burrito. Like, I mean, there's so many different ways that you can really transform that one food. So you're not just eating the same thing over and over again. Um, but again, like, I think one thing that's missing in the equation is the fact that for so many students, I mean, I, I'm a professor, so I teach a lot of students and many of them don't have the upper didn't never had the opportunity to really learn how to cook and they didn't have an opportunity in school um and um and it might not have been you know the case that they learn it at home as well so that's one thing that's missing i feel like a lot of the food education system like the whole um they call they used to call it home economics um is missing in the school education system so that skill um, needs to be like, we need to build that skill significantly. Mm. Yeah. We had, I think eight weeks in my school for the whole, my whole, um, educational, um, history. Um, we had eight weeks of food tech, um, and it turned out our oven was broken. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. yeah. So I would have loved, you know, more experience and more opportunity to learn these things. I was very lucky. My dad is very a very big cook so I got to learn from him but not everyone has those opportunities exactly and that's one of the things too like I think when I was in Indonesia um, especially with the um, mothers who uh, stay at home they usually have more of that time and opportunity to kind of pass on the knowledge but that's definitely not the case with families where the parents both work outside of the home they just don't have that kind of opportunity. And so there is that kind of like gap. So you have to get it from somewhere. And if you're not getting it at home and you're not getting it at school, you know, you might just grow up as someone who need to eat takeout all the time or can only like microwave. I remember a friend who told me that her partner, like the only thing he can do is boil water. And I was like, wow. And, and he's an adult. So, and I mean, I'm not judging him in that sense, like, you know, I feel like, oh my gosh, but it's like, oh my gosh, what is wrong with our system that an adult would grow up to not have any of that skill set like from anywhere, right? Mm, yeah. Um, thank you for sharing that. I hopefully, you know, if you know someone who doesn't know how to cook, maybe reach out to them and see if they want to learn. Yeah. Um, and they could also pay me. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> so of <it's> course. Nice. <laughs> They're just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Um, so for the open mic, um, this is a chance for you to talk about something that you're passionate about. Um, did you have something in mind? Yeah, so actually just um, a few months ago, I myself and my colleague Brandy Anchik, we launched um, our documentary called Food Is My Teacher. And it was it's a documentary that was commissioned by Canada's Broadca Broadcasting Corporation. Um, it's free in Canada, but you can rent it or like buy the documentary anywhere around the world if you just put food is my teacher and then you can you can grab it and it'll be available on Vimeo. Um, so basically this documentary, you know, takes me through my journey as um, an educator and how I kind of like highlight all of these beautiful food heroes from different religions, from different cultures and really showcase the healing power of food. Um, and that documentary kind of started um, in from a point of struggle. So the reason why food is healing is and why I strive to create a world where food is healing is because I didn't really have a good relationship with food. I actually started, um, I actually had an eating disorder a um, long, long time ago. And so food was something that I was actually scared of. It was kind of like this point of tension constantly, right? Um, and so in that documentary, you'll kind of also learn about my journey, how I found healing um, and how I now use like all of my experience to help my students have a, a really good relationship with the food system and kind of like give back to people and planet. Oh, amazing. Thank you for sharing that. I'm going to have to look that up. Um, yeah, it sounds it sounds like a very amazing documentary. And thank you for sharing your experiences as well. Yeah, no, I mean, the one thing that I feel um, is important, especially as um, a scholar, is also to kind of like break certain stigma. Um, a, a lot of people actually in, in Canada, it's actually a silent killer. And so for a lot of people, 
just knowing that it is possible to overcome and also understanding that people can talk about it and have a space and have other people listen to them is really a great way to just to kind of heal. Mm, yeah, I, I think there is still a lot of stigma around eating disorders. So um, yeah, we've got to talk about it a bit more. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, and if our listeners want to find out more about you um, and your work and also your documentary, where can they find you? So you can find my work um, at foodsystemslab.ca. Um, I'm very Googleable, so you can put my name in there. Um, I'm There's a lot of videos on me on YouTube, like doing a lot of uh, different talks on various matters. And um, a lot of my papers are also open access. So some of my papers around food in outer space, if you like that kind of stuff, it's also available um, online. So uh, definitely check me out there. And I'm also on LinkedIn. Great. Thank you so much. We'll make sure that... Uh... You, uh, all those links are online. I'm going to try and find that uh, out of space one so that I can l- read it myself and also put it in the show notes. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much. Um, I hope to chat again next time. Yeah. You've been listening to On the House, produced by the Household Management Science Labs, a division of LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. More episodes like this from across 10 life management perspectives can be found by searching LMSL on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, and other podcasting apps available on your smart devices. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating our show, sharing it, and subscribing to our channel as it helps other people find it so we can grow and bring you more quality resources. More of our work can be found on our website at hm dot lmsl.net where you can join our movement i'm gabriella yastra thanks for tuning in